that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now here's another mouthful that we have to unravel. So everybody of every class, rich or poor, will have to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. Now modern theology, which is a deceptive theology, tells us that this will be a barcode or similar which will be necessary for you to access your bank account. The question, of course, is, is God concerned about the way in which you access your bank account? Because currently we use a credit card with a code on it to access a bank account. Now, if that were stamped on the hand, would God then uh, deem you unfit for heaven? What is the difference? So, is this a literal mark or is it not? We have to look at the context. That no mind might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast for it is the number of a man. It's not the number of a barcode. It has to do with a man. And his number is 603 score and 6. So we now know it's the number of the beast, but it is also the number of a man. Now, where do we hear this word man in the Bible? Doesn't Paul speak about the man of sin? and all the attributes that are associated with him. And he has a kingdom, which is called a beast, and it has a number. So it is the number of the Roman system under the leadership of one man. And, of course, this is a continuous kingdom, so it's not one particular leader or pope, that is mentioned here, but the principle of all power resting in one man, and if they all speak ex cathedra infallibly, then one cannot change a precept of a previous one without denying infallibility. So it is a system that is con has a continuity that cannot be changed. So it's almost like the Medo-Persian system, because what went out of the mouth of a king could not be changed. And here you have exactly that same system. What comes out of the mouth cannot be changed. So the system has a man, whom Paul termed the man of sin who sits in the temple of God, pretending that he is God and having authority over God's people. And then he has a number. Now the magazine, Our Sunday Visitor, which is a Jesuit magazine, it's a publishing house now. It's grown since the time that this was written. And we asked the Jesuits here, what are the letters inscribed on the Pope's crown and what do they signify, if anything? The letters inscribed on the Pope's mitre are these, Vicarius Filii Dei, which is the Latin for the Vicar of the Son of God. Now some claim that this was uh, a mistake. But two years later, they published it again with the same explanation. I'm sure the Jesuits would know what is on the Pope's mitres, even if those mitres are under lock and key today for obvious reasons. So this comes from their mouth and was repeated twice. Vicarius Filii Dei, which is Latin for the Vicar of the Son of God which literally means in the place of the Son of God, which literally means Antichrist. <laughs> so basically, what's standing on the mitre is Antichrist, Vicarius Filii Dei, and the Latin letters have numeric value, and if you add them all up, then you will find that they come to 666. But it's not only the number of his name, his title, it's also the number of the beast. So if you use different languages, if you use the Greek, for example, then the official 
designations for this kingdom are the Latin kingdom, which in the Greek is Helatina Basileia, and that works out to 666 because the Greek letters also have numerical value. And don't confuse an E value 8 with an E value 5 because the one has a little line on it which gives it a different value. And then the Italian church, official title, Italica Ecclesia. And the Latin speaking man, the title for the papacy in the Greek is Latinos 666. They all work out to 666. So this beast power... The beast itself, the kingdom, has a number, 666, and the name of the man has a number, which is 666. Now it is beyond pure chance that you could have all of these together. So what is the mark of the beast? The only way we can find out what is the mark of the beast is to ask the beast, excuse me beast, do you have a mark? And the Pope answers, the Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. So he says that he stands above the Bible, he can change it. But the Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So obviously this is presumption to say that he has power to change the precepts of Christ. So what is his mark? Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change changing the Sabbath to the Sunday, was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Okay, is there another quote? Yes, Catholic record. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observant is proof of that fact. Obviously, Jesus in Matthew 5 from verse 17 onwards, says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law. And then he goes on to say, Not one jot or one tittle will by any means disappear from the law until all things have been accomplished. Till heaven and earth disappear, not one jot or one tittle will pass from the law. But here they claim that they've changed the law of God and they make it a mark of their authority. So this must be the mark of the beast. That's why in 2003, as a result of a document which was written when uh, the Sabbath Sunday issue became prominent in the United States in 1888, Rome answered, most Christians assume that Sunday is the biblically approved day of worship. The Roman Catholic Church protests that it transferred Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath, Saturday to Sunday. And that to try to argue that the change was made in the Bible is both dishonest and a denial of Catholic authority. So the issue is not the day, the issue is authority. If Protestantism wants to base its teachings on the Bible, it should worship on Saturday. Okay. So now Rome has told us what its mark is. Now is it possible that the United States could become involved in propagating Sunday as a day of universal rest? And if so, for what purpose? Well, let's have a look at it. Battlefield, United States, American face arrest as war criminals under army state law. And Luke says that men's hearts will be failing them for fear and looking for those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. If there is enough turmoil, political and religious, upon this earth so that men's hearts are failing them for fear, would legislation be introduced to, to ensure the so-called safety of the people? And this legislation, of course, would be contrary to the American Constitution, which admits to freedom of conscience. Senate approves indefinite detention and torture of Americans. Is that a possibility? It would force everyone to accept the mark of the beast and if you didn't accept it, you would be killed. Now here already, there are laws 
which approve indefinite detention and torture, the terrifying legislation that allows for Americans to be arrested, detained indefinitely, tortured and interrogated without charge or trial passed through the Senate on Thursday with an overwhelming support from 93% of lawmakers. Only seven members of the US Senate voted against the National Defense Authorization Act. This is very interesting. Is it beginning to speak like a dragon? Did Obama sign a martial law executive order? As folks headed out to happy hour last Friday evening, President Obama signed an executive order that could potentially give him the power to institute martial law in the United States in times of peace or during a national threat. In times of peace or a national threat? What if you have both? Does the United States already spy on its citizens and even on its allies, let alone its enemies? The answer is yes. Verizon forced to hand over telephone data, full court ruling. The people are being spied on. They have organizations such as Echelon where they listen in to all the conversations, computers, monitoring keywords, and nobody is exempt. Question, did the United States officially hack even their closest ally, Angela Merkel, yes or no? Yes. yes. And when the Germans found it out, they were extremely upset. And what happened? Did the United States apologize for hacking into the system? No, they told them to pipe down since it was their right to do so. And what did the German parliament say as a consequence? Okay, they backed down. So if even that level is hacked, how much more so everyone else? The Huffington Post, which was a satirical uh, little joke on this issue, made quite an interesting little picture. They took George Bush with his warmongering attitude and uh, Obama with his headphones on listening to the conversations and they melted them into one calling him George W. Obama. I thought they did rather a good job. <laughs> so as you are, so you speak. Is there an organization in the United States of America that is asking for Sunday legislation? And the answer is yes, the Lord's Day Alliance. The Lord's Day Alliance of the United States exists to encourage Christians to reclaim the Sabbath. The Lord's Day is a day of spiritual and personal renewal, enabling them to impact their communities with the gospel. And in challenging and economic times like the world faces in 2009 already, they said it, the world's Lord's Day Alliance is seeking to uncover scriptural truths regarding how the Ten Commandments combined with Jesus' teaching about money can provide guidance for Christians in daily living. Now this is an interesting statement because what is being joined with what here? Christianity and the economy. Now if I look at the mark of the beast, then it's fascinating because the mark of the beast will be implemented by buying and selling. That no one should be able to buy or sell. And then eventually, if you don't worship the image of the beast and the beast, then you will be killed, according to the scripture. So the economy is being dragged into this. This is fascinating. In 2001, when we had the debacle with the Twin Towers in New York, they say the World Alliance, the, the Lord's Day Alliance, sent out a newsletter. We are keenly aware that we, should not, that we sh could not do our work without financial support of friends like you. And then they say, at the time, the same time, the national tragedy that occurred on September 11 in New York, Washington and Pennsylvania has changed our perspective and frankly has caused even those who lack a spiritual thermometer to consider their faith, many of them for the first time in their life. 
we stand on the verge of an unprecedented opportunity to proclaim the message of the Christian Sunday in a manner not seen in the lifetime of this man. So the Lord's Day Alliance put out just recently a document where they claim Sunday as a mark. Isn't that an interesting terminology? Of Christian unity. And this was the Reverend Dimitrios Tonias, Sunday as a mark of Christian unity. So this is what will unite Christians throughout the world and also economic advantages. Now we'll see how they put this together because it's brilliant. The EU must keep Sunday, says the Catholic Church. And then in Brussels, in February 16, 2009, the Secretariat of the Commission of the Bishops' Conference of the European Community has welcomed the proposed EU law that would safeguard Sunday as a day of rest from work. So the Bishops' Conference, which is the Christian denominations together, went to the European Parliament and said, excuse me, we want Sunday laws. They were very excited that this was going to happen. But the European Parliament refused and threw it out. So it failed. Did they then capitulate? The argument that the Europeans had, it makes no difference whether you rest on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, a Saturday or a Sunday, as long as you have a day of rest. It doesn't matter which day you rest. But then, just a few months later, Germany decides they're going to go it alone. So the court rules that German shops must close on Sunday. Hmm. And so all the shops had to close. The court's president said, we will close on Sunday. So now there are stringent Sunday laws in Germany since 2009. And companies that refuse to obey were fined exorbitant amounts of money. Unbelievable. And so Germany sets an example for Europe. Spiegel Online, which is the equivalent of Time magazine in Europe, said most German newspapers on Wednesday greet the ruling. Some for reasons of religion and tradition, others out of concern for workers' rights. I found this fascinating. So there were two categories. Now, a few years ago, everybody would have said, crazy. There will never be a Sunday law. Never will there be closing on Sundays because this is a secular nation. Who cares whether we're open on a Sunday or not? But now, everybody agreed that this was a good idea. And there were two groups. The one group said, this is wonderful for religious reasons. And the other group said, this is wonderful for economic rest region reasons. Question.